Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. At this time of year, thoughts quickly turn to financial matters. The tax deadline looms. We've just completed the first quarter. Are financial projections on target or are adjustments required? Here in Ontario, following the release of the government's long-term economic report, anticipation of the next provincial budget is high. And the finance minister has miles to go before he sleeps. The Honourable Charles Sousa is Ontario's finance minister, a role he has held since February 2013. The minister brings a strong background in the financial sector to his current responsibilities. Before joining government in 2007, he held a number of senior roles with the RBC Financial Group. During a 20-year banking career, he was Director of Business Development, Commercial Financial Services, Director of Government and Community Affairs, and Senior Manager of Marketing at RBC Dominion Securities. Minister Sousa has served the riding of Mississauga South for seven years and has held ministerial posts since 2011. Prior to his finance appointment, he served as Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, Minister Responsible for the Pan and Parapan American Games, and Minister of Labour. In the community, he has been a member of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Toronto Board of Trade, and a director of the American Chamber of Commerce. Ontario's Chief Financial Officer joins us today to outline what needs to be done to build a stronger future for our province. Before I relinquish the podium, I want to let our live audience know that you can join the conversation via Twitter, where you can follow us at CDNCLUBTO or by using that hashtag. And now, Minister Sousa, the Canadian Club of Toronto's podium, Canada's podium of record, is yours. Thank you, Gordon, for uh, that kind introduction. And as all of you know, uh, by reading the papers, I would be here today. <laughs> In fact, I was with uh, some of my colleagues, uh, other finance ministers from Alberta and from British Columbia, who are also here today. And had they read the paper, they'd know that we wouldn't all be competing for the podium at the same time. Um, they're great. It's really great to see so many of you here, so many familiar faces, leaders, all of you in public service and in business. And I know you all leave, uh, lead very busy lives, so it means a lot that you're here taking the time to discuss Ontario's economy. As some of you know, and as just mentioned, I've spent 25 years or 20 years in banking and certainly five years prior to that in a, my own practice, my own business in the private sector. But I got my start actually, in Kensington Market. I grew up in a small business environment. My old man was always making deals as the market's wholesaler. I'd watch him walk up and down the street. It didn't matter if it was a weekday or a weekend. He had a knack, this guy, for making a sale. And he wasn't alone. At that time in the market, it was filled with business people, just like my dad, small business owners each trying to make a living to provide for their families. And I learned a lot from being around the kings of Kensington, whether it was Mr. Zimmerman's, the local variety grocer, or the owners of meat stores or bakeries, or as even some of you may know, Tom from Tom's Place on Baldwin and Augusta, right next to Madero's Fish Store. But they, they were the leaders of the day, the business leaders. They learned the art of business by living it. It was these street smarts of yesterday that helped me prepare in some cases for, for today. In fact, my whole life has been spent in the marketplace as a consumer, as an investor, or even now as the provincial treasurer. And if there's one important, salient, significant thing I've learned about the marketplace in all that time is this. The market is not some impersonal, external, uncontrollable force. It is the sum total of the decisions that we all make as people, just like that of Mr. Zimmerman, or Tom, or my dad. And don't stand up. My dad is here as well. He's always keeping an eye on me, this guy.
They wanted to make something. The reason I said don't stand up, because the last time he did, he did a pirouette and he stole the show. <laughs> um, they wanted to make something of themselves and give back to. The same is true for all of us in this room, all of you here today. Together, we give the market its shape. We give it meaning. We give it purpose. And while we must react to market forces, we're not entirely at its mercy. Those in the market with more resources, like large businesses and government, need to take care of how we choose to act or react within the marketplace. Because what we choose to do or choose not to do matters a great deal to a great many people. Which is why we need to find that sweet spot, that place where we, where we find both our competitiveness and our compassion, because they're not mutually exclusive. Instead, as Ontario proves time and again, an economy can be and must be both. That's been the Ontario way, the Canadian way. After all, this is a place where some of the world's most stable and competitive banks are right down the street from some of the world's best hospitals and universities, filled with some of the world's most compassionate nurses, social workers, and teachers. And we're building on that through our bold plan that invests in people, builds modern infrastructure, and supports dynamic and innovative business climate. Yesterday, our government released a long-term report on the health of Ontario's economy. We looked 20 years into the future, and it showed that we must continue to lay the groundwork for a stronger economy by building on our many strengths. Our well-educated workforce, our strong financial sector, our innovative students in our schools. But we also noted some challenges, for example, changing demographics, a lag in productivity, an aging workforce, which is leading to our pensions challenge. It will take a steady and experienced hand to guide our province through those looming challenges. And over the next few weeks, we'll release our budget, and you'll see actions to help make Ontario stronger for the long term. However, some challenges aren't so distant. Our economy is growing more slowly than anticipated and less than experts expected. Revenues are not only significantly lower than forecasted in 2010, they're even lower than we expected just last year. So we asked Don Drummond to review our revenue forecast. And as you know, he's not a man to mince words. He found overall forecasting was done accurately. But the economy around the world didn't grow as many had projected. This means that next year, our budget will see a revenue gap of $3.5 billion. Sometimes the economy throws you a curveball. So we do what's necessary. We step up to the plate. We cut expenses and made priority investments in the growing economy. As such, we've beaten our deficit targets four years in a row. In fact, this year, once again, we will beat our target by over $400 million. The 2013-14 deficit is now projected to be lower at $11.3 billion. And thanks to prudent management of spending and working together with our sector partners, Ontario runs the leanest government in Canada. We're now moving forward with more than 80% of Don Drummond's recommendations on creating efficiencies in the public sector. And we're surpassing expectations of savings in the system more than ever imagined. And we're avoiding more than $24 billion in additional borrowing. More importantly, we've done this without, ha without having to pick a fight with the public sector. Collaboration works, and it gets results. And as a result, we have the lowest per capita spending of any province. But we also have great schools and hospitals. We continue to contribute more to Canada than we give back, than we get back from the federal government to the tune of $11 billion. 
That shortfall is almost the same as our current deficit. And yet, this past December, the federal government blindsided us. They dramatically cut transfers to Ontario while increasing payments to every other province, substantially increasing payments to other provinces. In the past, transfer protection payments of more than $2.2 billion were provided to those other provinces that were affected. But this year, they didn't give Ontario that same respect. Instead, they ended the transfer protection payment to balance their own books on the backs of Ontarians. We continue to ask the federal government to live up to their own longstanding commitment to make Ontario whole. Notwithstanding, Ontario continues to lead. We weathered the global economy, economic recession, by diversifying our economy more than any other province. We're creating strong economic foundation that supports services and programs for the public. These principles of disciplined fiscal management and strategic investments will guide us in our budget. We're going to make investments to stimulate the economy and create jobs. However, as a result of the federal cuts and slower economic growth around the world, short-term deficit targets over the next year may not be met. But we will invest in jobs and growth. And that's because it's about the long game. And that means we will eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. And let me say that again. We're going to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18 on time as we said we would. But to get there, in the face of these new challenges, we're going to have to adjust the targets in the short term so we can meet our goal in the long term. This plan is pragmatic and realistic, which is necessary to ensure our long-term prosperity. Most people understand that. We all play a role. But Tim Hudak and the PCs don't see it that way. In fact, they're prepared right now to take a pay raise while demanding everyone else to take a cut. And that's not fair. And that's not leadership. They're hell-bent on cutting to balance budgets by sacrificing Ontarians, as long as it doesn't affect their wallets. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, extreme austerity hurts the recovery, prolongs the slump. And worse, it hasn't helped other governments meet their targets. So we reject that approach. Instead, our government, led by Premier Wynne, will fix our target on the end game and chart a balanced course to get there. This is not about the prosperity of any political party. This, this has to be about the prosperity of Ontarians. We believe in holding the ladder steady and letting Ontarians climb, making sure that no one is left behind, especially those most vulnerable. And we make no apology for that, because it's the right thing to do. Take the HST as an example or the fact that we recently just cut taxes for 90% of businesses in Ontario by eliminating the EHT. Adopting a high value added tax didn't win us any popularity contests, but our businesses thought it was a good idea. Economists thought it was a good idea. The federal conservatives thought it was a good idea. <laughs> and even most Ontario progressive conservatives privately admitted it was a good idea because it helped lower the costs of doing business and created efficiencies. And if you talk to small businesses in particular, it improved earnings before taxes, which helps create and keep jobs. And it also helps Ontario become more competitive at a critical time. It helped companies like Aya Kitchens, David Marcus is its CEO. When the US economy was in a downturn, it had to, he had to right size, and it was painful. American customers represented 80% of his sales, but the US market dried up during the recession. And so you know what he did? He invested in R&D to take advantage of tax credits offered right here in Ontario. This provided training opportunities, redesign of his products for his employees and his delivery, and improved his productivity. 
Our investments in infrastructure bolstered Ontario's economy as well, which offered a stronger domestic market for its sales as well as for many other businesses. And the HST lowered his costs. And now he's thriving. He's poised to expand sales to the U.S. He's doubled the size of his manufacturing facility. He has now been and is able to compete even more than before. This is Ontario's open for business policy. We encourage and welcome companies to grow in Ontario. These are not election cycle decisions. These are long-term decisions, aspirational decisions. That also includes programs like full day kindergarten. Now it's easy to see the compassionate side of that policy. Full day kindergarten not only helps young families save up to $6,500 per child, it also helps our kids get a good start in life academically and socially. People from across the political spectrum and all walks of life agree. Whether through the work of Dr. Fraser Mustard, policy leaders like Charles Pascal, or business leaders like Margaret McCain and Charlie Coffey, a banker and a mentor of mine. We know that early years are critical for children, so it's clearly compassionate. And industry leaders see it as an economic imperative, so it's clearly competitive. However, there are some that will argue for a quick fix to deficits by cutting and eliminating support for our children. Instead, we take a long-term view. These are competitive and compassionate policies. The same can be said of our approach to pension reform. People work their whole lives so that they can enjoy a secure retirement. For too many, however, CPP is their only foundation, and that's not enough. That is why the provinces worked hard to find agreement to encourage the federal government for an enhancement to the CPP in the future. And unfortunately, the feds showed a lack of leadership and courage and refused. Having knocked on many doors, I've visited many seniors living alone, waiting for Meals on Wheels or the local Red Cross for support. And they tell you stories of heartache waiting for their next CPP check just to buy groceries. They make a dollar stretch further than anyone can imagine. Because CPP is not enough. And in the end, it costs taxpayers, all of you, even more. And ultimately places a greater burden on our social systems. And then there are those that argue against CPP enhancement. And they aren't telling you the full story. They would have you believe it will forever be a drag on the economy. But experts disagree. Even federal finance officials disagree. We can't just kick the can down the road in hopes that some future government will solve these problems. That's not leadership. Experts say the long-term benefits of an enhancement outweigh potential short-term costs. Increasing savings now means a stronger economy and ultimately more jobs in the future. We must think long term and make investments for future generations. So we are pursuing a Made in Ontario solution, even though it's not a Made in Ontario problem. As participants in the marketplace, indeed as one of its most powerful players, our government is also encouraging new investments in Ontario. In fact, Ontario is ranked third in North America for foreign direct investment. We're also given top ranking by Forbes in various areas, including job creation, tax reform, and health care. The businesses of tomorrow are coming here and working with us to build and grow. For instance, Cisco recently made a major investment in the province. They're going to employ thousands of Ontarians. But Tim Hudak's PCs call that corporate welfare. We call it creating jobs and promoting economic opportunity. And we also have, we also have to be fair. We now have more early childhood educators. 
we have more people accessing developmental services. Workloads are increasing. We've invested heavily in home care, which has expanded the need for personal support workers in Ontario. Their jobs are critically important. Let me tell you a story. Her name was Barb, and she was a personal support worker who looked after my goddaughter, Sarah, who had cerebral palsy. It was extremely difficult for her mother and father to cope with those demands. They needed help, and they got it. Barb was the best thing that ever happened to them. She helped them day in and day out to look after Sarah. In fact, Barb was the last person to hold six-year-old Sarah when she passed away. She became a member of the family. And we need more people like Barb. And we can start by ensuring they have proper compensation for the critical work they do. They save our system more money. And in the coming budget, we will invest more in them. Ontario's 2014 budget will outline a strong plan, a plan to eliminate the deficit on time, on target, because we must ensure that we do not pass the burden of debt onto future generations. Some will look at this budget through the lens of the next election, and I accept that. It's fair. But it's going to be much more than that. It will provide for opportunities today, and it will secure our future. We're going to have to come to grips with some of those long-term issues that I mentioned earlier, challenges that we all face together. They're before us now. And the only responsible thing to do is to tackle them head on. How we do that, however, is up to us. Our government believes in a balanced approach. We all play a role in this. As I've said, I've spent 25 years in the private sector, and it's where I learned that corporate social responsibility is just as important as corporate profits. And why? Because we need to continue to build an Ontario that is every bit as compassionate as we are competitive, every bit as fair as we are prosperous. And in working together, focusing on what's best for our children and grandchildren, we can build that Ontario. We will build that Ontario. For me, that's the essence of what makes Ontario great. Our sense of determination without sacrificing respect for one another. That balance is at the heart of our civil society. And it is just as important as any financial balance on the books. And that is the beauty of Ontario. Thank you for what you do day in and day out for your leadership and for your cooperation in making Ontario a fantastic place. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fred Mifflin and I'm a director of the Canadian Club. Minister, thank you very much for spending the time with us today to discuss your government's plans for strengthening our economy. Ontario is Canada's economic base and every financial initiative, change or adjustment has far-reaching impacts, not just for Ontario but throughout Canada. These are clearly challenging times at Queen's Park, perhaps more than you or any of us would prefer. As our Chief Financial Officer, we're counting on you to continue to steward our economy forward in business investment, job creation, and infrastructure development, which you discussed. As you set out about finishing and presenting the next financial uh, provincial budget, we wish you all the best, and we look forward to learning more in the weeks to come. Thanks again for uh, being at the Canadian Club with us today. Thank you, Fred, and thank you again, Minister uh, Sousa. Minister, we know that these are busy days for you, and we truly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here with us, and we very much look forward to welcoming you and your dad back in the near future. 
I would also like to once again express our special thanks to today's event sponsor, Ernst & Young, and our reception sponsor, Campbell Strategies. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for your support. Before we adjourn for lunch, a few quick reminders of upcoming events. On April 7th, Canada's new finance minister, the Honourable Joe Oliver, will be with us to discuss the next chapter in Canada's economic success. On April 16th, Canada Post President and CEO Deepak Chopra will discuss what the Postal Service of the future will look like and how the company is transforming to meet the changing needs of Canadians in the digital age. And on April 24th, join our experts, Sherry Austin of the RBC Foundation, Andrea cohen Barak of the Ontario Trillium Foundation, and Susan McIsaac of United Way Toronto as they examine the new world order of philanthropy 3.0. To order tickets to any or all of our events, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. And finally, a video podcast of today's event will be available in a couple of days on iTunes. Simply visit the event listing on our website. Before we begin lunch, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in a toast to Canada. Please rise as you're able and join me in a toast to Canada. To Canada. Thank you again for joining us. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>